30 years after finding a baby abandoned in the trash, Ramon received an unexpected visit on a cold winter night. Faithful to his routine duties, he was fulfilling his role as an exemplary law enforcement officer when he heard a noise that interrupted his thoughts. He initially attributed it to a cat possibly roaming around in search of a brief romantic encounter. Challenging the chilly temperatures, however, he couldn't quite convince himself of this explanation. Hearing the sound again, he quickly realized it was the cry of a child coming from a trash can. Barely visible due to the fog, tucked away at the corner of two old adjoining buildings. Struggling, he hurried over the frosty pavement to the area to confirm his suspicions. Upon reaching his destination, he began searching through the heaps of garbage inside the public receptacle as the cries became increasingly distressing. He was shocked to find a little girl, who, when lifted into his strong arms, stopped her frantic crying and instead offered him a sweet smile. The young officer smiled back, feeling an immediate bond with the innocent creature. Who did this to you? Why were you abandoned among this filth? May God forgive them and have mercy. But don't worry, I will be your protector. You will never be alone. My little one, tomorrow, I will start the paperwork to adopt you as soon as possible," he assured her as he looked closely at the infant. The young officer remembered how, since he was a child with barely any reasoning, he had dreamed of becoming a distinguished law enforcement agent, a hero of the nation whose strict discipline would prevent public disorder, familial issues, and more. He also recalled once again that one of the happiest days of his life was when he graduated with honors from the beloved police academy, dedicating his life to serving others from that moment on. This would undoubtedly be another joyful day to be etched in his memory, having saved the life of a little girl left to the elements. However, upon taking her to the nearest health service and not getting carried away by the initial impression of the moment, he thought deeply about the difficult life the child would have under his care. He preferred that an older couple he knew, who couldn't have biological children, adopt the little girl. This way, she could grow up healthy with a mother by her side. When authorities were unable to locate the parents of a little girl, they soon decided to grant legal custody to a couple. Overjoyed and filled with happiness, the couple took on the responsibility of providing shelter, education, and nourishment for Angelita, a name they chose due to the demands of their increasingly challenging work, which was exacerbated by rising crime rates in the city. As days passed, Ramon, who had a close bond with the little girl, began to lose contact with her until he completely disappeared a few weeks after the adoption. As the family moved to the United States, they wanted Angelita to receive the best education possible. However, the young man never forgot the child he found abandoned in the trash on a freezing winter night. Always remembering her with the smile she gave him the moment he nestled her in his arms to provide the warmth she needed to survive. Thirty years after their initial encounter, Ramon remained a distinguished law enforcement officer, holding numerous awards and honors from his colleagues who proudly regarded him as a role model. One night, while on his usual patrol, Ramon stopped at a gas station to refuel his work vehicle. However, as he was about to proceed, he caught a pair of hooded individuals with hostile intentions cornering the cashier. Observing this scene, he aimed directly at the criminals, shouting, Stop right there, thieves, put your hands where I can see them. I repeat, put your hands where I can see them. Despite his commands, the criminals responded with a quick shot that struck Ramon in the abdomen. As the officer fell to the ground, the perpetrators fled in an unknown direction while a few witnesses, with the help of two others, rushed the injured young man to the nearest hospital. Due to the severity of his condition, Ramon underwent emergency surgery performed by a leading medical expert who, after ten grueling hours, managed to save the brave officer. Raymond's postoperative recovery would have been peaceful were it not for his persistent and insistent requests to see the doctor and personally thank her for saving his life. However, seeing her was nearly impossible, as she was considered the best doctor in the country and her services were in high demand at hospitals treating the most complicated health cases. Requests even came from abroad for her highly sought-after skills, the young officer, who had been making continuous trips was desperately awaited by everyone. 
As people insisted on seeing the doctor, they would ask every morning, afternoon, and night about their long-awaited visit. The nurses, trying to calm their spirits, would ask them not to worry because it was very likely that during their recovery week at the hospital, they would get to meet her and there would be no doubt about it. The young officer should have felt happy, as anyone in his situation would have been, but he was disheartened since the distinguished doctor had not shown up. Not even for a courtesy visit knowing one of her patients wanted to meet her. However, the nurses explained that she was a specialist in high demand for surgeries. A health professional who dedicated herself entirely to working with the most unfortunate patients. The day before he was to be discharged, the doctor called the hospital where Ramon was admitted to inform that she would definitely be visiting this time as her schedule was clear. But she asked that the convalescent not be informed as she wanted to surprise Ramon after his long and uncomfortable wait. However, one of the nurses, who had become close friends with the young man, couldn't resist telling him about the wonderful surprise they had in store. And upon realizing her mistake, she apologized to the people around and before rushing out of the room and then down the hospital corridors. She asked that no one mention anything to the rest of the medical team. The friend agreed and told her not to worry, as he would be a tomb in keeping the secret. Initially, Ramon waited patiently for his savior, but as the hours passed, he grew anxious because the eminence had not shown up. He wanted to know the reason for the delay and was about to call the nurses. Cleaning aides, or even the director, but he remembered that he had promised to keep the secret for his friend. As night fell and everyone else was resting in their respective beds, a nurse approached Ramon quietly and told him that the doctor was indeed going to see him but just before entering the facility. She received an emergency phone call which required the surgeon to head to another hospital to perform a surgery that was still ongoing. The officer couldn't believe what he was hearing and that night he needed a dose of sleeping pills, as the sadness and anger from his frustrated expectations wouldn't allow him to sleep. But before he managed to fall asleep, he calmed down, empathizing with the medical profession. The next day the on-call doctor discharged him early so that he could continue his rehabilitation at home and attend follow-up appointments at the health facility on the scheduled dates. Perhaps during one of these visits, he could meet the doctor who had operated on him, Ramon left the hospital with a mix of sadness and joy and returned to his home, where he continued to lament not having met the person who had operated on him. About a week after being at home, while he was performing physical rehabilitation exercises, the sharp ring of his doorbell sounded. Upon hearing it, he went to open the door, and as he did, a radiant woman appeared in the doorway. She was wearing a white coat and a stethoscope hung around her neck. Upon seeing her, Ramon realized in that instant that she was the person to whom he owed his life. He invited her in so they could have a quiet conversation. Seated in the living room while sharing a snack, Dear doctor, I want to thank you because thanks to you, I am still alive, but I don't know how to do it, because what you did for me is invaluable. I also want to thank you, Ramon, and congratulate you for the difficult work you do to help the homeless, she responded. Let me open my heart to tell you that I am alive thanks to the fact that when I was just a few days old, a law enforcement officer like you rescued me from the garbage where I had been abandoned during a cold winter night. Thanks to that person, I decided to study medicine and became who I am today, a woman dedicated to saving lives. Just like the hero who freed me, thank God, from the dark jaws of death, the doctor shared, smiling a smile that Ramon recognized instantly and responded to with another that the doctor also recognized. Both were transported back three decades in their lives, and without uttering a single word, while shedding tears of emotion, they hugged each other tightly with all the love they had, they talked about their respective lives throughout the afternoon. Among other things, the doctor told him that her biological mother had come forward when she was 15 years old. She learned that her mother had abandoned her due to serious problems with alcohol, clouding her judgment because of the excessive consumption of these substances or a cruel twist of fate. Just a week after the reprehensible act, her mother recovered her sanity and, believing that the baby had died due to the low temperatures, decided to check herself into a rehabilitation center, after a year of intensive therapy. 
she regained her faith and devoted all her energy to finding her daughter. Eventually, the information gathered led her to the United States. She also learned that they had been visiting frequently, and from that moment on, she would undoubtedly do the same with Ramon, her exemplary hero. Do you have any thoughts after hearing this story? Tell us in the comments section. Next to give you another story, let's continue to see it. In the remote countryside, a farmer stumbled upon twin babies in an old bus. However, upon closer inspection, he bolted in terror. Juan sped out like lightning from the abandoned bus parked on the edge of the fields he had just been plowing. His anxiety didn't allow him to control his steps, and he fell to the ground, but he quickly got up to continue his frantic escape, screaming for help in desperation, though no one could hear him in the vast emptiness of the fields. Someone help me, Juan kept running, feeling like his heart might burst. He decided to hide in the lush cornfield to escape from what he had just witnessed inside the vehicle. The dark night fell quickly, and Juan, overwhelmed by fear, hid among the corn plants. He thought of the loneliness of his beloved wife. If we only had even one child, he thought, they would keep us company. But God hadn't blessed them with children in five years of marriage. Yet neither he nor his wife ever complained about their situation, knowing why things happen in the way they do and accepting that humans, with their limited understanding, cannot explain divine decisions. Juan finally mustered the courage to leave his hiding place and make his way back home to his wife. However, he had to pass by the bus where he had seen those eerie figures. It's just my imagination, he repeated to himself as he walked slowly, trying to convince himself, it's just my imagination. These words were suddenly interrupted by the cawing of black crows circling over the cornfield, making Juan run once again without realizing where the sounds were coming from. His clumsy escape led to another fall, and he crawled to hide again among the plants. I've always been a coward, Juan thought, careful not to say it aloud lest someone hear him. He wondered how Maria ever chose him, a man who wasn't the brave protector she deserved. He had spent hours hidden in the cornfield, driven by fear. People always insisted that it was all in his head, a notion undoubtedly fueled by the legends he had been told since childhood by generations of ancestors, stories of the undead, ominous birds, and countless creatures that continued to haunt him. Whether he was awake tilling the soil or caught in the grip of nightmares, in the chilling darkness of the night, Juan tries to calm his racing thoughts. Stay calm. Don't dwell on those monstrous thoughts, he tells himself. Maria, his wife, is worried and waiting for him at home. Juan reaches into his pocket to grab his cell phone with the intention of calling her. But he knows all too well that it's futile. The internet signal never reaches the remote area where he's currently working. Consequently, he's unable to communicate with his spouse. I must overcome this fear that's consuming me, Juan thinks to himself. I have to do it for Maria. If I truly love her, I must destroy every obstacle. Come on, Juan, you can do this. Summoning his courage, Juan stands up and turns on his phone's flashlight to illuminate the area that had kept him hidden. To his horror, he finds a tattered figure crucified on a pair of timbers, its face shielded by a weathered hat, flashing a sinister smile. Oh God, help me, Lord, he cries out in despair. The farmer then starts running frantically praying to the Holy Father. As the peasant runs as fast as he can, he falls and then quickly gets up to continue his escape. When he feels he's at a safe distance from the danger, he stops and looks back, only to realize that it was just a scarecrow. It's all in your imagination. One, he tells himself, still panting heavily, despite being easily frightened by everything, from the crows now flying over him to the scarecrow that has been in the field for over three months and even by the little creatures he once found on the bus. Juan moves towards the school bus and hears the cries that had previously interrupted his farming. Just like before, he enters the bus to shine his flashlight on two little ones, feeling pity for them when suddenly he hears cries distinctly belonging to the infamous Lilarona. Oh my children, oh my children, without a second thought, Juan bolts outside and runs like never before reaching the garden of his home, located miles and miles away. In just a few minutes, Maria, 
Maria, open the door, please, he begs with a weak voice. What's happening? His wife asks as she comes out of the house. Noticing her husband now sitting by the well. What's wrong, Juan? She asks again. But Juan, overwhelmed and exhausted, does not respond, his soul is troubled, and his wife, recognizing his fatigue, helps him into the house where she insists on questioning him. But due to his exhaustion and the tumult after drinking a liter of water, he goes straight to bed and sleeps through the night. The farmer tosses and turns, suffering from high temperatures, sweating profusely, shivering, and his wife feels obligated to take care of him. Frightened by his own nightmares, he hears La Llorona and the Scarecrow yelling. Juan, haunted by his dreams, his children, the crows, the school bus the next morning. Juan wakes up calmer and while having breakfast, he describes in great detail the experience he had the day before to Maria, who, after listening attentively, tells him that it was all his imagination. Everyone in the village knows it and has advised him about it. His spouse says and then asks if he wants her to accompany him to work today. Of course not, exclaims Juan, full of energy and with fists clenched tightly, adding with the same fervor that it is his duty. The farmer bids his partner farewell and leaves the house heading directly to his workplace. No matter how much he tries to distract himself with the beautiful rural landscape and the fragrant morning crowned by a chorus of birds from winged and feathered musical artists, it is inevitable that legends come to his mind, especially that of La Llorona, the woman who, according to his great-grandfather, drowned her two infants in the river of the village out of despair upon learning of her husband's infidelity. The poor woman, soon after regaining her sanity, as his great-grandfather David would narrate, died of sadness and remorse, wandering like a tormented soul, lamenting with her characteristic cry over the loss of her children. The ghost of the woman occupies all of the man's concentration, the image of her white dress and the veil of the same color covering the face of the popular specter occupies his thoughts. Juan does everything possible to banish her, People tell me it's just a fantasy, an invention of our ancestors, and there are different versions as there are places. Juan continues to ponder, in one of them, it is mentioned that the husband ran away with the children, but I don't know which one to believe, and if those creatures I encountered on the school bus are the tormented souls of Lilarona's children. Enough, Juan, enough once and for all, Maria says, claiming it's all imagination, but they seem so real. He resigns himself to his fate and immediately begins his usual work, allowing him to focus solely on work. In a sudden moment, he heard the same cries from yesterday. Upon this recurring event, he decided to head to the bus alone, armed only with his flashlight. Upon entering, he saw the two little ones for the third time. He felt the urge to flee, yet he resisted, dropped his tool, and crouched before them. The cry of La Llorona filled the air but he shooed it away by shaking his head fiercely, attributing everything to hallucinations, but they are just a pair of little angels, exclaimed Juan tenderly, and then asked, what are you doing here? Who left you in this place? The farmer picked up the two little ones, who stopped crying and instead offered a charming smile as he lifted them from their makeshift bed made of old clothes. He found a piece of paper with a brief written text which he picked up to read, to whoever finds these little angels. I ask you for the love of God to take care of them. Since I cannot do it myself due to my dire economic situation, you will provide them with what I cannot offer, and they will grow up safe and sound, signed by a distressed mother. Juan was astonished by what he had just read and exclaimed, my God, this is a gift from the Heavenly Father. Just for that day, Juan decided not to continue working and went straight home where his faithful partner welcomed him. Absorbed with the two little angels, and of course, the small letter, after reading it, she cried out with joy, looking towards the sky, Juan, this is a blessing, praise be to the Lord. Both peasants, unable to have children of their own, decided to raise them and baptize them as Melchiades and Nathaniel which according to their great-grandfather David were the names of Lilorona's children. With this experience, the farmer finally lost his fear. Even though Maria played jokes on him by imitating the last cries of Lilorona to tease him, nothing caused him terror anymore, not devils, not birds of bad omen, 
not scarecrows, nor any type of tormented soul, as he realized that everything had been a product of his wild imagination over time. The twins grew up respectful and healthy with Juan and Maria, who once they reached adulthood, fixed up the old school bus where 18 years ago they were found by whom they considered their true father. Today, they can be seen transporting children from distant rural localities, thus facilitating their school life and thereby improving their quality of life. What did you think? What would you have done in Juan's place? Do you know of any cases where love has overcome fear and terror? We invite you to respond to these questions. We would like to ask you to join us and share until we meet again next time. May God bless each and every one of you.